Lost cities conjure up images of long abandoned ruins in remote jungles. But it's not always like this. 240 years ago, one of the most ambitious construction projects ever attempted in Ireland got underway just nine miles from Waterford City in the southeast of Ireland. In 1784, an entirely new city called New Geneva started to take shape. Built to rehouse revolutionary exiles from the Swiss city of Geneva, it was hoped that this city would become a major industrial hub in Waterford. Today, when you visit the site, it's just fields. You see, the plans for New Geneva didn't quite work out as hoped, although its history would take a fascinating, if dark, turn when it failed, because New Geneva descended into brutality and barbarism. This podcast tells that story. It's the history of New Geneva, Ireland's lost city. Hello and welcome to the Irish History Podcast. My name is Finn DeWar. Now this is the first full show of 2024 and it's a great topic to kick off the year. Even though I live pretty close to the site of New Geneva and have driven by it multiple times, I, like most people, was completely unaware of its history until last September when I came across a reference to it. Since then, the story of this lost city has drawn me in. Every facet of its history is intriguing. Now, this is the first in a series of really interesting one-off shows to open the year. Next week, I'll be exploring the story of a shipwreck, and then in the following weeks, we'll be covering a range of topics from 19th century Irish Mormons to the history of early photography in Ireland, and then censorship as well. This will lead into the first mini-series of the year, which looks at a pivotal event in the outbreak of the Troubles. All the while, I'm preparing what I'm calling Plan 2024, something I need your help with. Last week, I explained my ambitious plans for a series on the 1798 Rebellion. I want this series to take the show to a new level. The story of the 1798 Rebellion is one of the most gripping events in our history. And if done correctly, this series will be really special. But this will require additional resources, audio editing, voice actors, and most importantly, a lot of research. Now, to do this properly, I need 200 new supporters, and I'm really grateful to everyone who has supported the project so far. It's got off to a really great start, and I'm already able to make some of my plans a reality. The ultimate target is, as I say, 200 new supporters, and we can definitely hit that target. So if you can spare the price of a pint each month, please go to patreon.com forward slash Irish podcast. That's patreon.com forward slash Irish podcast. You'll make such a difference if you get behind this series. Now, I have a feeling today's topic is going to provoke a lot of interest. If you're wondering what New Geneva looked like, I have pictures, plans of the designs and sketches of the key figures posted to my new WhatsApp and Telegram channels. I've just launched these, but it's a really handy way for you to see what I'm talking about. Just click on the link in the show notes to WhatsApp or Telegram, whichever you use, and that'll take you to my channel where you can see exactly what I'm talking about. As I say, I've got images up there of New Geneva, of some of the architectural plans and the key figures involved. If you want to read more about New Geneva, the go-to guy for the history of this incredible site is a historian called Richard Watmore. I relied heavily on his 2019 book for the first half of the show. I have links to that in the show notes below. If you want to find out more, that's a really detailed account of where New Geneva came from. With all that said, let's get on with the show. Sound was by Kate Dunley. New Geneva and its history has many points of origin, but the best place to start in search of this lost city, is unsurprisingly in the old city of Geneva, an ancient settlement in the extreme west of modern Switzerland. The idea to build this city anew in Ireland was one forged amidst revolution, war and siege in the 1780s. But let me take you back a few steps to explain this properly. So through much of its history, Geneva, that's old Geneva in Switzerland, was a fiercely independent city-state. However, through the 1700s, tensions rose with its powerful neighbours, particularly the Kingdom of France. Geneva is actually surrounded by French territory on three sides, and the monarchs of France increasingly interfered in the affairs of the city. This was deeply resented, and matters came to a head in 1782, 
When a largely peaceful revolution saw a radical republican government take power in the city, desiring independence and autonomy, relations between the new government in Geneva and the Kingdom of France went downhill fast. By the summer of 1782, the French king, Louis XVI, had resolved to take action and depose the revolutionaries who had taken power in Geneva. To this end, he organised a coalition of forces and by June, a large army, numbering in the thousands, marched on the city. When they reached the walls of Geneva, it became clear they were going to take the city by force as they threw up siege lines and erected gun batteries. Inside the city, the revolutionary government knew they could not possibly resist these forces indefinitely. However, they were determined to fight to the bitter end in a dramatic show of defiance to the world. They mined several key buildings, including the city's ancient cathedral, with gunpowder. This they planned to detonate when the French inevitably breached the walls. However, in the early hours of July 2nd, 1782, with an assault on the city imminent, their zeal and determination faltered, or perhaps you might say they saw sense. Rather than fight and die in a battle that would kill thousands, the leading revolutionaries elected to flee the city. As they effected an escape, conservatives who favoured good relations with Paris took matters into their own hands and threw open the city gates. The assault was averted and the French occupied Geneva. Now in the aftermath of these dramatic events, it became clear that the revolutionaries who had fled into exile had no chance of ever returning to their native city. Their exile was a permanent one. Although dejected, and labelled as cowards by some, a core of these exiled Genevans were determined they would not simply be scattered to the four winds. Instead, they resolved that they would rebuild Geneva, or at least a version of it, elsewhere. The French could have the old city, but their new Geneva would become a shining example to the world. Now, as ambitious as this dream unquestionably was, the exiled revolutionaries were by no means without friends or allies. Their native city had a long reputation as a centre of industry, particularly in the fields of jewellery and clockwork, and the revolutionaries had enjoyed support among these artisans. Therefore, numerous governments across Europe in the 1780s, many of whom were hostile to the Genevans' radical politics, were nevertheless keen to attract these exiles to their countries. If they were successful in building a new Geneva, they could lure artisans that had made Geneva so famous and wealthy over the centuries. Now to this end, offers of refuge began to flood in from across Europe, and while communities of Genevan exiles laid down routes across the continent, a small, largely unknown Irish coastal village, that of Passage East, would emerge as the place where they would build a whole new city, a new Geneva. <laughs> From the outset, many of the exiled Genevans had been drawn to Britain for multiple reasons. First and foremost, British policy was heavily shaped by its opposition to French interests, and the adage, my enemy's enemy is my friend, forged an alliance, therefore, between Britain and the Genevans. However, there were other factors at work. The exiles were devout Calvinists, giving them a shared perspective with many in England. Furthermore, leading British politicians of the day up to the Prime Minister, Lord Shelburne, supported the idea of the exiles founding a new city in Britain. Indeed, by August 1782, scarcely two months after they had left their homes in Old Geneva, the exiled revolutionaries who had reached England were receiving promising offers. Not only had they been offered a huge tract of land in Derbyshire to build the city, there was also talk that the British government would provide a massive sum of £50,000 to get the plan off the ground. In the 18th century, this was the type of money needed to realise the project. This would allow people still in Geneva to emigrate to Britain, while it would also cover the costs of initial construction work. However, as the general idea gained traction among the exiled community, the Genevans began to favour Ireland over England as the site of their new city. Even though it was in the British Empire, the island was experiencing its own wave of political radicalism in the 1780s as a movement that demanded increased autonomy and democracy gained traction. This, the Genevans felt, ensured they would find kindred spirits in Ireland. They were also wary about their prospects in England. 
Economically, the future of England was very uncertain in the 1780s. Britain was deeply in debt, and the Genevans also feared that they would face hostility from British clockmakers and jewellers. As they began to explore the idea of settling in Ireland, they soon found numerous influential backers. Not only did the Lord Lieutenant, Lord Temple, support the idea, but major landowners like the Duke of Kildare and others were willing to provide them with land. Ultimately, it was the government in Dublin who took decisive action in terms of getting the project off the ground. They granted the exiled Genevans 1,800 acres of land surrounding the village of Passage East in County Waterford. Now, this location was chosen due to political concerns. The government were wary of the revolutionary politics of the Genevans and they wanted to keep them as far as possible from Belfast, the centre of Irish radicalism. The site they chose in Waterford put over 200 miles and several days travel at the time between the site of New Geneva and the Belfast radicals. So it came to pass that these exiles would build their new city on the site of a fishing village in County Waterford called Passage East. It was in 1783 that a man who would play a leading role in the city of New Geneva, the revolutionary Etienne Clavier, first set his eyes on what he hoped would become his new home, Passage East in County Waterford. Although Genevan born and bred, it's easy to imagine Clavier's enthusiasm. The village itself was tiny, a few dozen houses, built along a large river estuary, but the scenery around it was stunning. However, it was the fast-running currents of water in Waterford Harbour that surely made it so alluring. Three of Ireland's largest rivers, the Barrow, Nor, and Shore, combined upstream and flowed into Waterford Harbour at Passage East. This busy waterway had been the gateway to Ireland for thousands of years and it was an ideal location for a new city. Indeed, the Genevans were only the latest in a long line of settlers who had come to this part of the world. Roman traders had traversed these very waters 1,500 years earlier. In the Middle Ages, it had been the turn of the Vikings. In 914, they had established a trading centre upriver at a place they called Vederfjord. By the time Etienne Clavier arrived, this had grown into the city known as Waterford, one of the busiest ports in Ireland. This was all proof that their ambitious idea of rebuilding Geneva would work at Passage East. Plans began to move rapidly through the first six months of 1783. The Genevans asked for a grant of £100,000 from the government to kickstart the project. While this eye-watering sum was rejected, they were still given £50,000. This was plenty to get the scheme off the ground. Half of this would be used to construct new buildings, while the rest was earmarked to assist emigration of craftsmen from old Geneva. If the city was to be successful after all, they would need to establish a major manufacturing centre. The initial hopes were that this new Geneva would become, over time, a major centre of clockwork in Western Europe. Meanwhile, the most famous architect of the age, James Gandon, was busy preparing a new design for the city. It would be different to most Irish towns, which had emerged organically over the previous thousand years, meaning the street plans were often quite random. At New Geneva, there was going to be a grid system. At the centre of the city was an open area known as Temple Square, adorned with a large statue of Lord Temple, the Lord Lieutenant, who had been so supportive of the project. This was surrounded by rows of houses and buildings for workshops. It was complete with two churches, a prison and a marketplace. One aspect, however, remained a secret in 1783. Old Geneva had a famous university and the Genevans planned to build a similar institution at New Geneva, which would in time attract the greatest minds, they hoped, from across Europe. Now aware that this would arouse intense hostility from the highly influential Trinity College in Dublin, this was not yet made public. By the summer of 1783, a former soldier, James Cuff, had been appointed to oversee construction and the official turning of the sod took place in July that year. Construction, it was hoped, would be completed in 12 months. Although very hasty, such speed was necessary at the time. The Genevan exiles needed somewhere to lay down roots and establish their workshops. However, it was at this critical juncture that the new Geneva project began to encounter problems. After the foundation stone was laid, work stalled. A survey by an army engineer, Major James Ferrier, 
argued that they had chosen the wrong site of Passage East. He pointed out multiple problems with the location. Among the objections raised was the presence of a Catholic graveyard, which he said the Genevans would have a marked dislike to. Ferrier also highlighted that evictions of locals would need to take place and that this would arouse hostility. Instead, he suggested a site about a kilometre south of Passage East to be more suited to the project. This was, in fact, a far better proposal. Passage East would have restricted the expansion of the city given the local topography. The village, even today, is hemmed in by a river on one side to the east and steep hills to the west. The new location, to the south, however, was surrounded by flat land for miles. However, even after this issue was resolved, problems continued to mount. Summer 1783 turned to autumn, autumn turned to winter, and nothing was built. Meanwhile, the Genevan exiles began to grow restless. By the end of that year of 1783, considerable numbers had already made the long trek across Europe to Ireland. However, on arriving in Waterford, they now found New Geneva was still an idea rather than somewhere they could live and restart their lives. By Christmas of that year, the community of Genevans in Waterford now numbered 250 people, but they were forced to pay high rents while they waited for their new city to be built. As news of these developments spread across Europe, this would prove a major blow to the whole project. In 1783, the site of Waterford still faced competition from other exiled Genevan communities, most notably that of Brussels, which was already well established. This and other similar communities now began to drain away some of those skilled craftsmen who were going to be the core of this new city in Waterford. Nevertheless, the project was by no means dead. A considerable number of Genevans remained committed, and some had already started to adjust to life in Ireland and even married. However, it was clear the plan would need to be readjusted if the craftsmen were establishing themselves elsewhere. Therefore, a new idea was drawn up that envisaged New Geneva as a centre of learning focused around a university. The new year of 1784 finally saw construction begin. The site was cleared and houses finally started to appear. However, it was still at a very slow pace for the Genevans hoping to restart their lives. Nine months later, by the autumn of 1784, only a few dozen of the houses had been laid out around Temple Square, the plaza that was going to be the centre of the city. The Genevan exiles in Waterford increasingly began to doubt that it would ever become the flourishing city they had hoped for. Meanwhile, they also started to encounter considerable political problems. While they began to trash out the details of how New Geneva would be governed, they found Irish politicians unwilling to meet their radical demands. The exiled revolutionaries wanted a charter that would afford New Geneva rights and privileges beyond anything other towns or cities in Ireland enjoyed. Essentially, they wanted New Geneva to be a semi-autonomous city-state in Ireland. This was never going to fly in 1780s Ireland. The authorities were resolute on this issue, and this, along with the delays to construction and the allure of other cities across Europe, was the final nail in the coffin of the project. By 1785, the plan was dead in the water. The Genevan colony in Waterford had dispersed across Europe, and Etienne Clavier, one of the most enthusiastic supporters, had left Waterford for Paris. Construction finally stopped in 1785, and while the city was nowhere near complete, considerable building had been completed. The city centre of New Geneva stood now at the site. Around 60 houses surrounded what was supposed to be Temple Square, that plaza at the heart of the city. While it lay empty through 1785, it was clear that this site would not remain idle for long. Indeed, it would soon have inhabitants, but life there could not have been more different than the original hopes and dreams of the exiles. Before the 18th century drew to a close, it would be used precisely for the opposite purpose it had been designed. Rather than provide a refuge for exiled revolutionaries, it became a prison for revolutionaries awaiting exile. Hey folks, before we dive into what I think is the most interesting part of the history of New Geneva, I just want to give you a quick reminder about those ambitious plans I have for the coming year. I'm really excited about the prospect of making that series on the 1798 Rebellion. I'm sure you can hear it in my voice that I'm really passionate about telling that history. It's an incredibly gripping story and with your help, I think we can make something really special. Now to do it properly, I have set that high target of 200 new supporters on Patreon. 
based on the response so far, I'm pretty confident we'll make it and create what will be a really cool series. Now you can make this happen by becoming a supporter at patreon.com forward slash Irish podcast. That's patreon.com forward slash Irish podcast. The decade that followed the cessation of works at New Geneva in 1785 was a tumultuous time for both Europe and personally for some of the individuals who played a key role in the New Geneva project. Louis XVI, the French king who had forced the revolutionaries into exile in the first place, was deposed and executed by revolutionaries in France in 1793. Among the leading figures in that revolution was Etienne Clavier, the Genevan revolutionary who was among the most committed to building that city in Waterford. However, he also fell foul of the revolutionary government in Paris and he was arrested in 1793. He would die by suicide in a French prison while awaiting a trial that would probably have seen him executed. Meanwhile, back in Ireland, the site of New Geneva found itself increasingly drawn into the revolutionary turmoil emanating from these dramatic events unfolding in Paris. When the plan to build the city of Geneva had been shelved, various schemes had been suggested to put the site to use. Eventually, in the early 1790s, a wall was thrown up around the houses that had been completed and it was converted into a military barracks for the British Army. Given the extent of works that had been completed, it became one of the larger barracks in Ireland. It could house nearly 1,800 troops. Now officially known as Geneva Barracks, the army had been attracted to the location for much the same reasons as the exiled Genevans had been in the first place. It overlooked the waters of Waterford Harbour and this provided an ideal embarkation point for regiments being sent overseas. However, it would be the end of the 1790s when New Geneva would eventually have its first revolutionary residence, although that term resident masks what was truly happening at the site. In 1798, New Geneva would become a key location in the rebellion which broke out in that summer, pitting Irish rebels against British forces. Now, the story of the 1798 rebellion is obviously the focus of my upcoming series this year, so I'm not going to go into detail at this point. But in terms of the history of New Geneva, it suffices to say that as battles raged across Ireland, the British army increasingly found themselves with growing numbers of prisoners. To deal with these rebels, the authorities dispensed with law and order and tried them at court martials. While large numbers were executed, Many were forced to enlist in the British Army or sent to penal colonies across the British Empire. Now, the legality of these sentences was highly dubious, but before anyone could mount a challenge, the authorities decided they would just get all the convicted rebels out of Ireland and essentially create a fait accompli. This would see New Geneva transformed into a massive holding prison for convicted revolutionaries while they awaited transport ships to take them out of Ireland. Yet again, the decisive proximity of the site to Waterford Harbour had been central in the decision to repurpose New Geneva as a prison. Transport ships could easily dock in the waters of the harbour while the prisoners could be guarded for what was a short march between the prison at New Geneva and the pier at Passage East. Through 1798, large numbers of rebels were incarcerated at New Geneva. These were all people who had been found guilty and sentenced to service in the British Army, so it was kind of a mix of a barracks and a prison. It was not just designed to hold the rebels, but also it would break them and force them to obey military orders. The regime, therefore, was brutal. The 19th century historian of the 1798 rebellion, R. Madden, described it as a monster prison where the conditions were uniquely shocking. Now, more recently, the historian Michael Jury has urged caution in this regard, pointing out that New Geneva was not as bad as the conditions on board the floating prison hulks in Cork Harbour. While this is true, New Geneva was still appalling by any standard. The surviving accounts demonstrate the brutality and sadism of the military regime. The most detailed memoir survives from the hand of a man called Andrew Bryson, a rebel from County Down. Captured by British forces, he was found guilty at a court-martial in autumn 1798 and sentenced to life service in the British Army overseas. This effectively exiled him from Ireland. He would never return home. Furthermore, he would have to fight for the very army he had been rebelling against in Ireland. Bryson would spend six weeks in New Geneva, but after being transported, he did manage to escape. 
In 1801, he wrote a letter to his sister that was more akin to a book which detailed his experiences and it gives us a great sense of what New Geneva was like in these years. Bryson explains that because the prisoners were effectively soldiers, they were fed relatively well. He received meat, bread and potatoes on his first night there. But any infraction of military discipline provoked a savage response. Now initially, life at New Geneva was defined by monotony. The prisoners were so closely guarded, escape seemed impossible, and they were sort of resigned to their fate. However, when word spread amongst them that the ships that would transport them from Ireland were due to arrive imminently, desperation set in. The last window to escape was closing fast, so attempts to free themselves became common. Bryson described the extreme brutality meted out to those who tried to escape. When two rebels broke their legs trying to climb over the walls of New Geneva, they were brought back inside the prison, flogged a hundred times, and only then they were treated by a doctor. After several escape attempts, the authorities took the clothes from the prisoners and warned anyone in the locality that they would burn their houses if they sheltered an escaped prisoner. This didn't deter the escape attempts. Bryson himself was part of a group who tried to break out. And when caught, they were severely treated. Four were hacked down with swords and five more were flogged 400 times each. The authorities then terrorised the remaining prisoners by forcing them to march around the mutilated corpses of those who had been killed. After three days, they hanged the bodies from a gallows. Bryson also recounted the brutal treatment of two women who tried to smuggle clothes into their husbands who were incarcerated in New Geneva. They were stripped naked in front of the entire garrison, their hands tied behind their backs, and then they were subjected to various forms of torture. This included being beaten, whipped with rods, doused with cold water in the middle of winter, and then finally cast out of the jail. A generation later, the historian R. R. Madden recounted a similar fate which happened to another woman, a Mrs. O'Neill, who visited her son in the prison. She died from her ordeal. Eventually, on February the 25th, 1899, the ships that would transport the prisoners from New Geneva around the world arrived, and Andrew Bryson, along with around 400 others, were marched out of the prison. The authorities had mobilised around a thousand soldiers who lined the road between New Geneva and the harbour at Passage East to the transports which would take them across the Atlantic. These prisoners, including Andrew Bryson, were transported to the Caribbean where they were pressed into service in British Army units in Martinique and Jamaica. Now bad as this was, others sent to New Geneva in the aftermath of the 1798 rebellion suffered an even worse fate. In 1798, the British government allowed its ally, the Kingdom of Prussia, select several hundred prisoners to serve in their armies in Eastern Europe. The experiences of these men would prove harrowing but remarkable. Having seen action in the 1798 rebellion, they were, as I said, sent to Prussia. Some there, however, ended up being forced to work in salt mines in Silesia. When Napoleon invaded Prussia, they were forced then into the ranks of the Prussian military. However, after Napoleon's victory at the Battle of Jena, they were taken prisoner by French forces. Then, at this point, they were reunited with Irish rebels who had fled Ireland for France, and some would even go on to join the Irish Legion who fought in Napoleon's army up to 1814. Now, back on the banks of Watford Harbour in Ireland, New Geneva barracks began to adopt a degree of normality as the 19th century opened. By 1801, it had been restored to a military installation rather than a prison. Peace would finally return to Europe in 1815 and by the late 1830s, New Geneva was completely abandoned by the British Army and it quickly fell into a ruin. Over the last two centuries, all traces of the city that was started there in 1784 has disappeared and the wall surrounding the site is all that's left of its military history. Indeed, its extraordinary history took place over just five decades, but few places in Ireland have a past that could rival it. In many ways, the original plan, I think, was always doomed to failure. It was extremely ambitious from the outset. That historian I mentioned at the beginning, Richard Watmore, has argued that corruption in Ireland hamstrung it from the get-go. Among the main beneficiaries of the entire project was the Alcock family, a dynasty that dominated political life in Waterford at the time. They managed to get £12,000 from very advantageous land sales. Another issue was the fact that the Genevans had alternatives. The emergence of communities 
of exiles in Brussels and then Constance provided them with alternatives when New Geneva in Waterford encountered problems. There's another issue I haven't really gone into in this episode, but that's also the religious background of the Genevans. They were all Calvinists and had deeply sectarian attitudes towards the Catholic population around the site of New Geneva. This would surely have become a considerable problem had the city taken off. Now, while I didn't go into that in any detail in today's show, I will have a post on Patreon that looks at that in greater detail. That will be available at patreon.com forward slash Irish podcast on Friday. I'd love to hear what you made of this episode. It's a really incredible story. You can post your thoughts on what you made of this episode and the history around us there. Finally, if you want to see plans, maps and images of New Geneva, check out my Telegram and WhatsApp channels. I have the links to both of those in the show notes. You can see exactly what I've been talking about today there. Now, next week, I'll be back with a story of a shipwreck. That's a fascinating story. Until then, Sloan. Thank you.